Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to install an AFR gauge and you probably wonder what the hell is an AFR gauge? Well you'll see in this video what this is all about and believe it or not we're going to install it on a mini. But before we start a little bit about AFR. So we have different fuels, right? We have fuels that are having methanol in it, we have fuels that have no methanol in it, they have all kind of additives. But typical pump gas E10 or something or E5 has around 14.7 parts of air versus one part of fuel and that's the most optimum mixture for burning. In that case all fuel is burned in the engine if you apply that ratio for that type of fuel of course. And that's what we call the stoichiometric value. So every type of fuel has its own stoichiometric value. Sounds like a fancy name but it's not hard to remember. So it is so important that we try to keep that value, the stoichiometric point or the stoichiometric value for your engine. So for instance if you're running on idle you want to have that air fuel mixture around the stoichio point. The same thing for cruising, you want to have it around the stoichio point. However, if you're going to accelerate, you're going to need a more richer mixture. So then we'll shift that point up. And if you're going to go wide open, then of course you also want to have a richer mixture. But if you let off the throttle after wide open, then you want to go back to lean. And that's a bit what the ECU in modern cars is doing. And ECU is the electronic control unit and it's going to measure the oxygen inside the exhaust pipe. It's going to do this in many different areas. It does it just after the exhaust um, uh, manifold, but it will also do it in front of the catalytic converter and it will do it behind the catalytic converter. There's a lot of O2 sensors that we have in a modern car and they're going to drive mainly your ECU to provide more or less injection into your fuel system. Now with a classic car, it's a complete different story. We do not have an ECU, we have a carburetor. But again, on the carburetor, we can adjust the idle jet, we can adjust the acceleration pump, we can adjust the Venturi for wide open. So we have possibilities to adjust the AFR with all these parameters on a carburetor. And that's why an AFR gauge is very useful even on a classic car with a classic carburetor, because I will be able to measure all the values running on idle even on acceleration and the good thing about a proper gauge for that and I have an AEM gauge and I'm not going to make a commercial for them but that gauge allows you to log so you can attach your laptop and you can log while you're driving and you can actually see it what's happening at what moment in time and that will allow you to tune further your carburetor. But before we can do all this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the oxygen sensor, what this is about. I'm going to give you a little demonstration on a car I have in the back here on how that works. And then um, we're going to start installing the actual gauge itself and the sensor in the exhaust manifold. So let's get on now to the oxygen sensors and what that is all about. This is the most important part of your AFR gauge. It is a O2 sensor which is fitted into the exhaust pipe nearby the exhaust manifold. And it's going to measure on the tip how much oxygen is in the exhaust. It cannot do that right away. It needs to be heated up or it has to rely on the heat from the engine. So that's why you have some heating wires inside to heat it up for cold start purposes. But the oxygen sensor actually comes in two types. There's a narrow band one and there's a wide band one. So let me show you on the board what the difference is. Now this specific one from AEM, which is actually a Bosch O2 sensor, is what we call a wide band sensor and it's going to give me far more information than what a narrow band sensor will do. And that's the one we will have to install. But first of all, a little bit about narrow band and wide band O2 sensors. All right, guys, we are back to the drawing board and the air fuel ratio or AFR uh, is a critical factor in adjusting your carburetor. And we also have identified that the Stochio metric value for normal gas at the gas pump without ethanol in it uh, is around 14.7 parts of air versus one part of fuel. Now that is very important. This is the value you want to have when you're running at idle and when you're running at cruising speed. And that's why the O2 sensors are coming in uh, as a very important key element. It may be that you're going to use other fuel. Maybe you're going to run pure ethanol and then it's completely different to value. And if you're going to use a narrow band 
sensor O2 sensor in the exhaust then it can only measure voltages between 1 volt and 0 volts and you can see this is a very small span that's why we call it narrowband and a 14.1 ratio equates about to 1 volt in fact it's going to be around 0.9 volts and that means you're running a really rich if you're running lean then you're going to see a 15, point, uh, 15 parts to 1 part uh, of ratio and then you're going to see the voltage has been dropping near to zero so you can see that the air fuel ratios between running um, rich and lean is very narrow and you can't use a narrow band O2 sensor for other fuels under standard gasoline so this is not really good because if you're going to accelerate with the car your acceleration pump is going to inject extra fuel into the engine and then for sure you're going to shoot up above the 14 and you can't measure that and that's not good so that's why a wideband sensor is a lot better because the wideband allows you to measure between 12 to 1 to 22 to 1 of a ratio so this is extremely rich and this is extremely lean and this is the kind of stuff you need if you're going to tune your car if you're going to accelerate with the acceleration pump you're going to go way above 14.1 and you're going to shoot into maybe the 12s or even the 13s who knows it all depends a bit on your acceleration pump but this is where you can measure with a wideband um, oxygen sensor and that's why this AEM uh, AFR gauge is using a wideband Bosch sensor not only does it have to measure it but it also has to measure it very quickly so you want to have a closed loop operation between normally your ECU and your sensor now on our cars with a carburetor or classic cars we don't need this loop because there's nothing to, we can adjust dynamically on the carburetor but still um, it is good to have that sensor so you can log while you drive and then you can adjust your jets afterwards so what I'm going to show you now is an example of a narrow band um, AFR a sensor that I have laying around from my old Lotus Elise and I'm going to stick it to the exhaust of an MGB GT and we're going to run it up and we're going to look at the scope what the signal does when we're running up the engine with a choke, when we're running the engine at idle and when we are accelerating and hopefully you will see how that O2 sensor will vary in time on the value of oxygen depending in what state the engine is so don't expect a very flat line all the time it's not that it's going to vary a lot and you, the best way to measure this is with an oscilloscope I just want to make one more point on these two uh, types of uh, sensors don't always expect that to be a fixed voltage or a variable voltage some of them are using pulse code modulation to feed back the information so you have to check out what the sensor is if you really want to measure it out so in my case here the narrowband sensor we're going to use that is an easy one that is just a voltage 0 to 1, to 1 volt and we're going to have a look in a second so I'm going to apply some heat to that because they have to be heated up uh, the exhaust is not going to be that warm because I'm going to fit it at the tailpipe of the exhaust which is not where it should be but because I don't have a hole to fix it near to the exhaust manifold so I'm going to apply a 12, 12 volts heating um, element to it so it can warm up because they can only work properly when they are warm and that's why you find the most modern O2 sensors a heating element so it reduces emissions uh, during cold start now we shouldn't forget that the origin of an O2 sensor is coming from emission control purposes so enough talk let's do some work this is our wideband oxygen sensor which I'm not going to use in this little test because I'm going to use this in the mini and that comes with a whole bunch of cables as you can see but you'll see how we install all this later on when we get to the practical installation of the AFR gauge but what I want to show you now is a narrowband oxygen sensor that I have inserted into the exhaust pipe of this MGB GT the two white wires are going to a power supply 12 volts so I have a heating element inside this um, oxygen sensor because otherwise it's not going to work too well 
and also the heat of the exhaust fumes are not going to be that hot as it's supposed to be to make it work properly normally this oxygen sensor is a lot closer to the engine and I also have hooked up an oscilloscope and the oscilloscope will actually measure the output of that sensor so we should be seeing a voltage between 0 and 1 volt depending on the state of the engine now I'm going to turn this on and let it sit here for a few seconds because uh, it has to warm up and otherwise we don't have a proper reading so bear with me a few more minutes and then I'm going to start up the car and I'm going to put the video camera onto the scope and at the same time I will talk to you so you can actually see uh, what is happening so I'm going to start up the car and then let's look on the scope what it does Now the engine is running on idle and the solid white line that's the zero volts as you can see zero volts the line on the top is what I get from the sensor so if I move it up to the sensor line I can see I have about 380 millivolts so that seems to be a pretty good mixture probably around 14.7 I would have to calculate and look it up but that looks all right if I now was to increase uh, the mixture by pulling the choke up then I should see that line actually going up and it should probably shoot up to about one volt or so so let me have a look if we can achieve this back to idle and we are about right back where we were before and now it's time to install the probe on the exhaust now the probe should be installed as close as possible to the engine but at least 45 centimeters away from the engine block itself so from the exhaust manifold and this is about the proper place also if you install the probe you can't install it horizontal or fully vertical you need to install it with at least 10 degrees angle so that it doesn't get polluted with water or condensation uh, so be very careful with that and to install that you will need to drill a hole and then weld on this um, nut or whatever it is or lug and then weld it on there and then you can actually install the probe and by screwing it in there like so and then we should be good to go so the next thing I'm going to do now is to remove the exhaust so first of all let's take the exhaust off and I'm going to spray it a bit so um, these bolts come, bolts come loose without destroying anything and uh, we'll do that all the sections as well where these uh, tubes fit together um, that is always a great help um, because otherwise it may be tough to get it off uh, Now I don't want this whole exhaust now to fall down, so I'm gonna tie that up a bit. So. And now that should be a bit easier. So the next thing is that we need to drill the hole in the pipe to fit this attachment and for that we're going to measure the size of the opening 
of the actual O2 sensor, and I think this is about 15 millimeters. All right, so we got it clamped in. So now I'm gonna drill the pilot hole and then we'll make a bigger hole afterwards. All right, that fits perfectly. So now we need to weld this adapter on there and I want to have it right in the middle. Now to make sure it's centered, I'm going to use an old oxygen sensor that I had laying around, which is actually broken and I can uh, place it like this and then weld it on. And that way I know it's going to be centered right. But before I do so, I will reshape a bit this part that I'm going to weld on because that is flat and this is a bit curved. So I'm going to try to make a small curve into this piece and then we'll stick it on there. So let's see if we can fit the oxygen sensor. It may not be the best weld I ever did, but it is solid and it's airtight. Uh, let's see, and I think this is going in quite nice. All right, and that's it. So now we can fit back the exhaust. And it's always good to clean up the pipes before you put things back together, because otherwise it may be a bit tough to get it on. And then let's see if we can get it on. Here we go, that went very smooth. I have installed the exhaust and already inserted the probe and already cabled it up a bit. So now I need to tighten it down so it doesn't leak. Um, and you can see how I run the cabling. And this is the connector side and that's then running through a hole back to the passenger's uh, cabin where I'm gonna connect it to the dashboard. Uh, nothing really special, but just make sure that the cabling is tight, that it doesn't hang loose so it doesn't get caught by anything. And I have placed actually the plug where the sensor connects to the cabling going back to the uh, instrument itself or the gauge uh, backwards. So whenever you drive and you get water coming, uh, you can actually protect it a bit uh, so it doesn't get in. And as you can see, the sensor is sitting under an angle and it should be as a minimum 10 degrees. So that should be all good. So now I'm gonna lower the car and we're gonna cable it up inside. As you could see, that installation of the sensor wasn't all that difficult, but you gotta take off your exhaust. Drill a hole, weld on that lug, and then put it all back together. Make sure you have the right degrees, or so more than 10 degrees at least of angle, so that the uh, sensor doesn't get polluted. And then uh, do your cable run, and it depends on your car and how you do all that cable running. I've done this installation underneath the car in about half an hour to 45 minutes. It took me a bit longer, of course, because I've been taping it, but normally you can do this within 45 minutes. Of course, it all depends a bit on your specific exhaust and how easy it is to get it loose. But then again, you gotta make sure that whenever you do this kind of work, that everything is in tip-top condition on the car. It doesn't make sense to start putting these gauges in and all this kind of stuff. If your exhaust is in very bad shape, then it's not worthwhile because the exhaust has to be airtight. All right, so now let's get on with the gauge itself and then we cable all that up and then we can give it a try and see what it does. So we have the cable coming into the cabin and now we need to connect it all up to the gauge. Now, the gauge will need two connectors. It will have to have a 12 volts supply and then also the cable coming from the probe. Now on the other hand, the gauge as well has a RS-232 output signal where you can connect the log or two, but it also has a connection to the CAN bus. Now I don't have a CAN bus in this car. This is an old car, but otherwise you could connect it to your CAN bus. 
So I'm going to provision uh, just maybe the RS-232 logging port on it, power and the O2 sensor. That's all what I'm going to connect. And this is actually the cable uh, that you would use to connect it to the plus 12 volts to supply the gauge, but also to your canvas. I installed this dash not that long ago, and uh, probably I shouldn't have locked it up at the time. But I wanted to drive it and test out the car, so uh, that's why I already had it put together. Um, so now it's just a little bit of fiddling to get it all open again. Oops. All right. Here we go. Let it hang like this. That's all right. See all the stuff in here? That's what I put in there just to keep the noise down. So let me take this out now because now we need to do some cabling first. So we're about ready to cable it all up. There are two main cables going to the gauge and the diagram comes with the gauge. There's this bigger connector, which are all these connections right here. And then you have the smaller connector, which is already in the car coming from the O2 sensor. Now, if you want to log your data while you're driving, you want to measure all the FR values, then you're going to need to have an RS-232 port, the serial output. And that's typically built on a DB9. And this is a DB9 right here. You know, hopefully you can see that. Um, it, it is a small connector with nine pins. That's why it's called DB9. And you need to build this yourself. You get it from the store and then you solder the wires on it. And you need to have the blue wire coming from this plug. This is the blue wire right here. The blue wire has to go to pin number two. And then the black wire, which is the ground, has to go to pin number five. So that's what you will have to do uh, if you want to log. If you don't want to log anything, you don't need to do this. If you want to have additional connections uh, to another sensor, for instance, then you might have to use those cables as well. And if you want to hook it up to your uh, canvas, then you might need additional cables to be hooked up. But these here, you can't really use on your mini or classic car. You can only use the log wires and, of course, you're going to have to have the plus 12 volts from the battery going into the gauge for it to work. And that's going to be the red wire, right? This is this red wire. You need to hook that up to your battery and it comes out on this plug right here. And, of course, you're still going to need a ground as well. So that's what we're going to cable up right now. Uh, this part here, I'm going to mount this on my dashboard on an aluminum plate so it's nice and tidy. Um, you don't need to do this if you don't want to, but that's what I'm going to do because I want to log it while I'm driving. All right, so let's start putting this together. I have removed the ashtray and then I reused the opening to install my logging port on a piece of aluminum. And I called it Potty. Uh, that's the only label I had, but it means probably potential meter or something like that. But I know what it is. It means providing data. So now I'm going to cable it all up and then we'll see if it's going to work or not. I've reinstalled the dashboard, so now we're going to turn on the gauge for the first time. So let us zoom in a bit and see what it's going to do. So let's turn on the ignition and then we can see what happens. So it's now heating up. And remember that I said that the probe or the O2 sensor requires uh, some heat. So if the engine is running, you have automatic heat. But right now, um, the engine is not running, so it has to heat up the probe a bit to um, have it to work. Now, there's different modes of operation. I'm just going to show you that real quick. Um, so that's four digits display. Three, uh, this is actually Lambda. If you want to measure the display in Lambda, that's what you should use. Um, you can go to a O2 measurement, which is percentage uh, of display of oxygen. And a rich mixture display is a zero. Uh, you can also go for um, air calibration. We don't need to do this. You can set up your CAN bus if you want or change to ENM CAN messages. And then the last one, which I'm really interested in, is my real AFR. And I'm already, as you can see, in AFR because I don't have the option. So, that's all there is to it. The engine is already warmed up, so I'm going to start it up again and I'll show you what the reading is. I've done a little bit of adjustment on the carburetor on the idle mixture screw. 
but I will do it again once the engine is running so you can see uh, what the effect is on the air fuel ratio. So let me start up the car and then we should be good to go. Takes a few seconds. Right, and as you can see, we are running around 14, 7 average. So it goes up and down a little bit. So this is kind of the idle mixture, what we wanted to get. Now, if I'm going to change the idle mixture screw on my carburetor, you will see it change. So I'm going to turn in the screw a bit more on the back of the carburetor now. Now the reading has gone down, you see that? Now we are 13.2. So I've given it a little bit more richness now, and so now we are at about 12 or so. Um, so that's um, fairly rich, I would say. So now I'm gonna turn it back out to make it leaner. There we go. Uh, now you see we are running a real lean, 17, 18. So I'm going to put it back to 14.7 and you can even hear it on the engine, it doesn't run smoothly. So let me put that back and tune it in. Yeah, no, it's a, still, a, it's about right. A little bit more. Yeah, that's about right. Give it a bit of throttle. And you see how your AFR actually changes. What I see here is that my air fuel ratio, when I give throttle, is actually my fuel mixture is getting really lean. That means I don't get enough fuel. So I will have to adjust this carburetor. Once I'm cruising, That should be about right, you can see that. So folks, we are nearing the end of this video and what you've seen so far is that an AFR gauge is very useful, even on our classic cars. It's great to tune your carburetors now. I haven't done a lot of tuning, haven't done any data logging. We'll do that in another video because otherwise this would take too long. But what you have seen at least is that I was able to adjust my idle mixture. And I showed it to you on lean and rich, and I put it back to 14.7. The other thing I wanted to mention is that when I floored the gas pedal, you could see on how my mixture went lean, way too lean, 15.7, 15.8. Now that means that my carburetor is not up to it. It does not provide enough uh, fuel in the mixture when I'm accelerating. So these are all little things I will have to fix later on the carburetor. And that's why this tool is so great to have. You could as well um, remove it afterwards. Some people do that. You could mount a meter in a box and then just have a stop on that sensor underneath the car. And each time you want to tune the car, you put the sensor in. That's another option. I decided for a fixed installation. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in my next one. And by the way, guys, Ultrasty is coming, believe me, but I still had some issues on some very specific parts to find. Meanwhile, I should have them by somewhere by next week or so. And I know I've been saying this for a while, but my parts sometimes got stuck today, uh, most likely because of COVID, I don't know. Anyhow, um, keep watching and thanks for your comments. Bye.